Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. Wyoming, August 2nd, 1867. Just before 7 a.m., 18-year-old Samuel Gibson peers out from over the top of a wagon box, eyes wide and pulse quickening as he surveys the horrifying scene that lies before him. Hundreds of Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors swarm all around the enclosure made of simple wooden wagons detached from their wheels. From here, Gibson and 31 other men, a combination of soldiers and civilian laborers, will now, in very short order, be forced to fight for their very lives. They are a mix of veterans, old hands and teenagers, all from a variety of backgrounds. They have all, however, heard the accounts of what happened to the men who had been killed by many of these same warriors less than a year earlier on December 21st of 1866. The day after the dreadful battle, the commanding officer of the nearby Fort Kearney, then Colonel Henry Carrington, led a detachment of cavalry to the site of the battle, where they were greeted with the horrifying sight of their comrades' bodies strewn about a frozen landscape in various stages of degradation. His personal account of the event included descriptions of the bodies of soldiers that had been scalped, eviscerated, emasculated, their tongues, ears, and noses cut off, and bludgeoned until their faces were unrecognizable to even their close comrades. News of the massacre had been the talk of aghast Easterners in cities like New York and Philadelphia for weeks in the early part of 1867. All across the territory, settlers and soldiers alike kept their eyes nearly perpetually cast at the horizon in search of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors known to be riding under the command of the legendary Red Cloud. The mere mention of the name Red Cloud often stirred up simultaneous feelings of intense rage and primal terror amongst the inhabitants of Fort Phil Kearney. To some degree or another, nearly all feared befalling a fate like that of their cohorts in the Fetterman Massacre. Now, for the men trapped inside this ad hoc fortification of wagons and supply boxes, the reality staring them starkly in the face is that they might suffer the same fate today as their unfortunate comrades had only months earlier. As the young Gibson surveys the horrifying scene, he and the others busy themselves with the cold, hard necessities of preparation for combat. With several thousand rounds of ammunition on hand, they are in fact amply armed in combination with their Springfield repeating rifles to combat the threat at hand despite their numerical disadvantage. In what initially seems to be an inexplicable scene, Gibson sees several of the older veterans hurriedly stripping off one of their boots and tying a three-foot length of cord to their big toe while tying a larger loop left hanging inside the trigger guards of their rifles. In the event that they are overrun, the men intend to slide the larger loop over the trigger and deprive their attackers of a live prisoner. The Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors now amassing all around them have already completed their battle preparations. Having daubed themselves and their ponies in their bright war paint, filled their quivers, loaded their rifles, and checked to see that their bowstrings are taut. The Sioux, known amongst themselves as the Lakota, are the largest amongst them in number. Hailing from their ranks, in addition to their leader Red Cloud, is a young warrior rapidly building a reputation as a fierce and fearless fighter known as Tishanka Whitco, or Crazy Horse. The Cheyenne and Arapaho hail from the northern ranges of present-day Colorado and Wyoming, and though they are two decidedly distinct cultures, they have been longtime allies and are often seen by many as inseparable entities. These mighty tribes, each comprising their own highly capable and highly consequential patch on the proverbial quilt of the northern plains peoples, have come together and put aside any lingering disputes in order to pursue their common enemy in the Americans. Though the driving force in this desire is the decades, if not centuries of encroachment on these lands they claim as their own, they are also keen to build their own reputations as warriors, unafraid to fight and die for their people. These warriors are actually the larger contingent of a group that is split off from another roving band of Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho who, unbeknownst to their comrades at this moment, have spent the previous day engaged in a vicious fight against another contingent of civilian workers and army soldiers outside Fort C.F. Smith in present-day Montana. That fight had resulted in many of the Sioux, Cheyenne, 
and Arapaho warriors being cut down by the ultimately overwhelming firepower the Americans were able to wield with the advent of their new rifles. In the preceding decades of warfare between the tribes of the Northern Plains and the U.S. Army and American settlers, the Americans had been at the mercy of their diminutive rate of fire. Prior to the invention of the breech-loading repeating rifle, rifles were loaded via a cumbersome loading process that limited even experienced users to but a few rounds in a minute. Until now, the tactics of most Plains tribes have consisted of essentially evoking and then weathering the first volley of rifle fire, after which an advance could be made while the Americans hurried to reload in time. Comparatively, though they also possessed rifles, the rate of fire that could be produced by a well-trained warrior with a traditional bow and arrows dwarfed that laid down by the American rifles. Countless times on the American frontier, from Texas to Montana, soldiers and settlers alike were overrun and cut down, suffering fates much the same as those of the unfortunate souls at Fetterman's Massacre. While advancements in weapon technology had certainly been made, perhaps most notably with the advent of the rise of the Colt Patterson and Colt Walker revolvers, the need for a rifle capable of a greater rate of fire had long been an apparent one on the frontier. Now though, in a scant few years since the Americans' Great Civil War had concluded and so many more had flooded westward, the repeating rifle had drastically altered the landscape of Plains warfare dynamics. But while the Americans have their new weapon in their rifles, the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors assembling all around the desperate men inside the ring of wagon boxes have an invaluable weapon of their own, the thus far incomparable leadership of their trusted leader, Red Cloud. Though his presence at the battle today is disputed by historians, his leadership and command are, regardless, palpable. As the young warriors whip themselves into a fury, knowing that many will inevitably meet their ends today, they fill the air with cries of Hokahe, or it is a good day to die. Back inside the wagon box fort, the commanding officers, Captain James Powell and Captain John Janess, survey the situation at hand. Janess has one eye closed, the other tucked snugly into the eyepiece of his army telescope. He informs Captain Powell that he believes he has, indeed, spotted Red Cloud. Understandably, this adds another layer of dread to the men preparing themselves to engage the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Lakota in battle. As the officers discuss any final necessities in hushed tones, an appalling silence falls over the rest of the men, as they peer out in all directions at the warriors intent on ending their mortal stay before the sun sets on this day. The teenaged private Samuel Gibson Though already a veteran of several small skirmishes, but wholly new to combat on this level, attempts to question his older cohorts as to what they think their chances might be in the fight to come. You're going to have to fight like the Dickens if you want to get out of today alive, kid, remarked one, referring to him under his deceptively endearing nickname. Finally overcome by the same resolve as his elder companions, the young man begins the process of removing one of his own boots and tying a cord to his big toe. Just as Gibson finishes tying his first loop, however, the call comes down from Captain Powell. Men, here they come. Take your places and shoot to kill. The following is an excerpt from Private Gibson's personal recollections of the events that follow. Resting my rifle on top of the wagon box, I began firing with the rest. The whole plane was alive with Indians, all mounted and visible in every direction. They were riding madly about and shooting at us with guns, bows, and arrows, first on one side and then on another of the corral. Then they would circle, and each time coming in closer, uttering the most piercing and unearthly war cries. Some of the most venturesome would ride in close and throw spears at us, and others, still more daring, would ride in within a hundred yards and then suddenly drop off one side of their ponies, and all we could see would be an arm or a leg sticking up above the pony's back and whiz would come their arrows. They paid dearly for their daring, for we had steady rests for our rifles, and the Indians were all within easy point-blank range and we simply mowed them down by scores. The tops of the wagon beds were literally ripped and torn to slivers by bullets. How we ever escaped with such a slight loss I have never been able to understand. After we had commenced firing, a great number of Indians rode in very close, probably within 150 yards, and sitting on their ponies, waited for us to draw ramrods for reloading, as they supposed we were yet using old muzzle loaders. But, thanks to God and Lieutenant General Sherman, the latter had listened to the appeals of Colonel Carrington, the commander of Fort Phil Kearney the previous year, and we had just been armed with a new weapon. 
and instead of drawing ramrods and thus losing precious time, we simply threw open the breech locks of our new rifles to eject the empty shell and slapped in fresh ones. This puzzled the Indians, and they were soon glad to withdraw to a safe distance. Though the attacking Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors are indeed incensed at the intruding Americans' incursions into their lands, the American soldiers and civilians fighting from behind the wagon boxes are themselves angered. Though they have all felt a sickening dread at the thought of being caught alive by these mighty warriors of the Northern Plains, most have also burned for revenge against those who had tormented and so cruelly dispatched their friends and comrades at the Fetterman Massacre the year prior. Also, most prominent in many of the men's minds is the fact that a mere six miles away, at Fort Phil Kearney, are many of the men's wives and children who will be the next target in line should they fail to repulse the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho here. Meanwhile, the attacking warriors now do their best to rescue their comrades, who are wounded, but still alive, out on the coverless open ground in front of the wagon box fort. The sheer daring of their ventures sparks feelings of admiration in their adversaries, even in the heat of the dreadful fight. Continuing from Private Gibson's account, after recovering a great number of their dead and wounded at a fearful sacrifice of life, the Indians withdrew to a safe distance, but while recovering their injured, we witnessed the most magnificent display of horsemanship imaginable. Two mounted Indians would ride one on each side of the wounded savage, reach over and pick him up on the run, and carry him to a place of safety. This was done many times, and we could not help but admire their courage and daring. During this relative lull in the action, the men scrambled to resupply themselves with ammunition, literally crawling on their hands and feet to the ammunition boxes in order to procure themselves more cartridges. Some of the men take on these resupply duties while others continue to fire at the wounded warriors and their rescuers. At the same time, on the bluffs to the east and west of their position, two parties of Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors are trading flashes from small signal mirrors, determining their next move. Gibson's account continues. We did not know what to expect, but we knew that they would soon attack us again. Something desperate had been determined upon by the savages. All we could do was wait and watch. Not a word was spoken. It was a moment of suspense that was simply terrible. As we sat and waited for what we thought would be the finish of us, I looked along the wagon beds and saw my comrades sitting there watching the assembling Indians. Every man had his jaws firmly closed, with a grim determination to fight until we were overpowered. We did not know what time it was, and nobody cared. The fight had commenced about seven o'clock in the morning, and I did not hear any man ask about the time of day during the fight. Nearly all of us were bareheaded, as we used our caps and hats to hold ammunition. The sun beat down with a pitiless glare that terrible August day, and it seemed like an eternity to us all. Suddenly, someone on the north side of the corral yelled, Look out! They're coming again! A cry goes out amongst the men in the wagon box fort. The tents! The line of tents had, thus far, presented a significant problem in firing upon the charging warriors, as they blocked the view of the defenders until the warriors came around their edges. Now, Seeing one last chance to improve their odds before the next attack, several of the defenders, including Gibson, hurriedly take down as many of the canvas structures as they can before being called back by their officers. Again, from Gibson's account. With the tents down, we could see the Indians to much better advantage, and were enabled to deliver a more effective fight. The whole plain was again alive with countless swarms of the warriors, assembling for another grand charge upon us. Our fire was terribly destructive, and deadly in accuracy, and we repulsed them again, but our gun barrels were so overheated from the rapidity of our fire that the metal burned our hands, and we were obliged to open the breech blocks during this lull to allow the barrels to cool off. During one of these momentary lulls, Grady asked me to go out for more ammunition. I crawled out of the wagon box westward and saw several other men after more ammunition, and as I looked towards the west end, I saw the body of Lieutenant Jeunesse, shot through the head and heart. Within a few feet of the corpse, Private Jim Condon was fighting between a barrel of beans placed in between the interval of Captain Powell's wagon bed and the one wagon with the cover on. Horrified, Gibson crawls back to his wagon with the ammunition and informs the others that Lieutenant Jeunesse has been killed. Good God, the men exclaim. Anyone else? Gibson replies that he does not know, and amidst the men's terror, grief, and confusion, they must now keep up their fire against their attackers. Young men of often similar ages to them and themselves in deep states of grief and rage at the loss of their own friends and comrades. Gibson's account continues. 
About this time, word passed around that Privates Henry Haggerty and Tommy Doyle had been killed on the north side of the corral. The brave little Jerseyman, Haggerty, had been shot through the left shoulder earlier in the fight, but the fact had been kept secret by the other men in the wagon bed, lest some other man become disheartened. The men in the wagon box with Haggerty wanted him to lie down after getting shot through the shoulder, but with his left arm hanging useless at his side, he had used his good right and kept on loading and firing for over two hours, until the Indians on the North Ridge finally killed him by sending a bullet through the top of his head. Doyle had been killed some time after the first charge, while bravely fighting behind a breastwork of ox yokes. He was struck in the forehead. In addition to the casualties, water is now running low as well. Cries for water resound inside the confines of the wagon box fort, and just when it seems like the plight of the thirst-stricken men cannot possibly become worse, the native warriors begin to rain down arrows with flaming tips into the fort, catching fire to the dry grass and manure pile used as fire fuel. One of the water barrels lies roughly 20 feet outside the west end of the corral, and is now nearly empty after being perforated by numerous bullet holes. However, when it seems like all hope is lost for the thirst-stricken men, the camp's cook, a man referred to as Mr. Brown in Gibson's memoirs, informs the men of two of the camp's coffee pots, which had been filled early in the morning, but he had not yet had time to boil. The coffee pots are, however, precariously located underneath the camp's chuck wagon, a few yards outside the ad hoc fort's walls. Gibson and another man named Johnny Grady volunteer to make a scramble for the water, and with the covering fire of their cohorts on the northern wall, they are able to secure both coffee pots, albeit so narrowly that one pot is hit and largely drained by a native warrior's bullet. Now, another lull in the attacks drags on, taking its toll on the defenders inside the wagon box fort, both mentally and physically. Returning again to Gibson's account. The time between each charge dragged heavily, and the days seemed almost endless. Yet the Indians on the north side of us, hidden under the ridge, kept us constantly on the alert, and some of them on the east ridge, about 200 yards from the east side of the corral, would run out towards us once in a while, armed with spears and tomahawks, each carrying a big shield made of buffalo hide. There they would brandish their weapons in a menacing manner and utter shrill war cries. There was one big giant of an Indian who had thus run out several times from the ridge to the east, and he always managed to escape our fire, until he apparently thought he bore a charmed life and that we could not kill him. He had led all the previous charges from the east end of the ridge and must have been a sub-chief, the last time he appeared must have been at about two o'clock in the afternoon, and this time he came out slowly but grandly, with his big buffalo shield in front of him, brandishing his spear and chanting a war song. Then he would hold his shield on one side and run toward us, jumping into the air and alternating this movement by dodging to one side. The sight was fascinating, and we could not but admire this superb courage. Several of us had fired at him, but without effect, when one of the boys at the east end remarked, we have simply got to get that fellow, as he thinks we can't hit him. We carefully adjusted our sights, taking accurate aim, and just as he shifted his shield aside and began running towards us, we fired together, and he leaped into the air and came down limp as a rag, barely riddled with bullets. We all breathed easier after this warrior was killed, for his death seemed to put a stop to any more charges from that direction. The Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho again draw back again momentarily content to take pot shots at the men in the wagon box fort, but avoiding major charges. By Gibson's account, Red Cloud is indeed present, and commanding the battle from atop a ridge to the east of the wagon boxes, where the largest congregation of warriors are presently coalesced. We could plainly hear him or some other chief haranguing them in a loud voice. Presently, a great number of Indians rode down the big piney valley out of sight. Another party, several hundred in number, rode out on the plain toward us, evidently for another charge. We all knew that they had lost scores of their braves and killed and wounded, and their maddened frenzy would make another attempt to overwhelm us by a force of superior numbers, and they would take a horrible revenge on us if they captured us. It must have been after three in the afternoon when, straining our eyes for sight of that line of skirmishers in the glorious blue uniform, meaning the reinforcements, we could distinctly hear a sort of humming sound, seemingly made by many voices below us in the big piney valley. Some of us thought it was the squaws wailing over their dead warriors, and as the sound grew louder, some of the men on the north side of the corral rose to their feet to see if they could discern anything below them in the big piney valley. But they had no sooner risen to their feet than the others yelled at them, Down, 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 or you will get hit. 
as we waited in the silent wonderment of this strange sound, unlike anything we had ever heard before. The echo appeared to come from the northwest of the corral. The Indians to the east and south of us had come out on the plain, where they were circling and coming nearer all the time, brandishing their spears and war clubs at us, and giving voice to their war cries. Those of the warriors who were armed with guns immediately opened fire again upon us, and we at once replied, killing and wounding many more of them. During this time, that awful humming, chanting sound grew in volume and intensity, coming nearer and nearer, now directly west of us. The Indians to the south had withdrawn off the range and seemed to be waiting for something to happen. Then, something happens. A cry comes out from the west side of the wagon box. Here they come! As yet another charge of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors cascades down upon the defenders. Suddenly, a sight appears that, according to Gibson, no one present will live to forget. His account continues. It chilled my blood at the time. We saw hundreds upon hundreds of Indians swarming up a ravine about 90 yards to the west of the corral. They were all on foot, formed to the shape of a letter V, or wedge, and were led by Red Cloud's nephew, who wore a gorgeous war bonnet. Immediately, we opened a terrific fire upon them, under which nothing could stand, and at the first folly Red Cloud's nephew fell, pierced by many bullets. Nothing daunted, the forces came on slowly, and in great numbers, the places of those who fell under our fire being taken immediately by others. So close were the Indian hordes by this time that the heavy rifle bullets from our guns must have gone through two or three bodies. They were soon so near us that we could even see the whites in their eyes. As they swarmed toward us with the shrill cries and piercing whoops, Private Jim Condon jumped to his feet from behind his barrel of beans and shouted as he waved his rifle over his head, Come on, you blathering sons of guns. We can lick the whole damn bunch of us. Captain Powell, who was close by Condon, at once ordered him to lie down. Despite Condon's challenge, or perhaps partly in response to it, the dogged onslaught of Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors continues until they are merely yards away from the wagon boxes. At this point, the men inside the confines of the ad hoc fort open fire yet again, yet again falling warriors by the dozens. Gibson's account continues. Our fire was accurate, coolly delivered, and given with most telling effect. But nevertheless, it looked for a minute as though our last moment on earth had come. Just when it seemed as if all hope was gone, the Indians suddenly broke and fled. They could not stand before the withering fire we poured into their ranks. The several hundred mounted Indians on the plain south of us, who were intently watching this foot charge, never offered to assist their red brothers by making a mounted charge, but discreetly remained out of rifle range. According to Gibson, Red Cloud himself continues to survey the battle from the ridge to the east. Gibson and several others made shots at the party situated on the ridge, even claiming to have killed some, but no substantiation for this action beyond Gibson's memoirs can be ascertained. Suddenly, much to the confusion of the defenders, the warriors on the eastern ridge begin to break off, riding out of sight in groups of twos, threes, and fours. Seeing this, their footbound comrades also retreat. The men in the wagon box fort are momentarily unsure of the cause until they, too, hear the resounding roar of the Howitzer field cannons now being utilized against the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho by the U.S. Army forces en route to reinforce the wagon box defenders. No native plan of attack in history involved the purposeful loss of warriors in order to hold strategic ground, and with this in mind, the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho depart onto the plains, almost as suddenly as they have appeared. In their stead, scant minutes later, are the silhouettes of their reinforcements, eliciting all manner of reactions from the overjoyed defenders. We all jumped to our feet and yelled. We threw our caps in the air. We hugged each other in the ecstasy of our joy. We cried, laughed, and fairly sobbed like little children in the delirium of our delight. The awful strain was over. The bodies of Lieutenant Jeunesse, Private Doyle, and Private Haggerty are laid with great care in the field ambulances brought by the reinforcements. Captain Powell is informed that they are shocked to find any survivors at all. The survivors make their way back to Fort Phil Kearney, eyes still wide and nerves at the ready, the entirety of the six-mile trek. Gibson would go on to a long career in the army, but for himself and the men who had survived this hellish day, this fight that would come to be known to history as 
the wagon box fight would mark their most trying day. I have served in the army 48 years, taken active part in the Sioux campaign of 1876 and also in the Wounded Knee campaign of 1890-91 at Pine Ridge Agency. But never before or since have my nerves ever been put to the test they sustained on that terrible 2nd of August 1867 when we fought Red Cloud's warriors in the wagon box corral. For Red Cloud, as well as the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, the wagon box fight would spell the beginning of the end. Despite his tactical and strategic brilliance, the Americans' weaponry and sheer numbers are beginning to take an irreparable toll on all the Plains tribes. Within a few decades, the way of life for the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho that they had come to know and love so deeply would be brought to an end after decades of brutal conflict. But though the end may be in sight for Red Cloud and his warriors, their story is not yet over. The Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho though they will scarcely if ever see this level of military success again, have plenty of ire left for the intruders coming to take their lands. It will be many years before anything like peace will be seen on the northern plains. Years replete with bloodshed and atrocities committed on both sides. But the stories of those battles, war crimes, and other tragedies are, for tonight, other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking the join button or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.